we're good to go. Well, thank you all for coming. My name is Zachary Klein. And uh, how many of you, of you um, here were in my talk yesterday about JavaScript frameworks? One, two, three, four, five, okay. All right, a few of you. Cool. So um, that last talk that I did was a little more high level, um, talking generically, more or less generically, about um, approaches to uh, using modern uh, front-end JavaScript frameworks within the context of Grails applications and Grails projects. And we didn't really look at any code or see any application of the ideas and the approaches that I was talking about. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, I work at OCI, and we're, uh, we are the sponsor of both the Grails and the now Micronaut frameworks, as well as the Groovy language. Um, I'm sure you all have heard that once or twice by now. A couple things I'd like to point out just to the beginning. Again, hopefully all of you are familiar with these things. Uh, Start.grails.org, our version of the Spring uh, Initializer for Spring Boot. You can generate your Grails projects from here, and you can generate a Grails project uh, using Vue, Vue.js, from that very website. So take a look at that. In fact, the uh, demo that we'll be looking at today, um, I don't actually remember exactly how I created the project, but it is exactly what you would get um, if you were to download uh, your project from that that uh, website today. And also the Grails guides. Step-by-step uh, -step tutorials. I've written a few of them, including a couple that are on using Vue.js with Grails. Um, and some other JavaScript uh, stuff is, is covered in uh, various guides on that site. So do take a look at that as you have interest and time. Uh, there's tons of other guides as well that I've had nothing to do with. All kinds of great stuff there. Okay, so our agenda. This is an interesting talk. I've been talking about Vue.js for about the past, not quite a year. Um, and in my talks, I would always, I would talk about Vue.js and I would be using Grails under the covers. Like, I'd be using it as my back end, but I wasn't talking about Grails. So this talk originally was to talk on Vue.js. And if you're watching closely, you would notice that um, there was some Grails magic going on. But I didn't get to talk about that. So now I do. That's really fun. So, uh, so that's basically going to be our outline. So the first, uh, first, uh, item on the agenda is going to be an overall look at Vue.js, um, a bit of a comparison or at least um, uh, giving some, some context as far as where it fits versus frameworks like Angular and React. Um, I shouldn't say like Angular and React, those are exactly the frameworks we'll be comparing it to, is Angular and React, those are kind of the, the giants uh, in front-end space these days. And then we'll look at uh, how we can use uh, Vue.js with a Rails application. And hopefully, most, or at least half of the talk will be taken with um, the actual uh, coding demo. Uh, we'll see how quickly I can get through all this, uh, all the introductory material. So, Vue.js. So my first response, uh, my first thought when I heard about Vue.js was basically what you see on that slide. I mean, yet another JavaScript framework. This is getting a little bit ridiculous. Uh, and another talk I gave, I was looking at, I was trying to make up a, a name of a non-existent JavaScript framework. It took me a long time to find a name a word that was not a JavaScript framework or library of some sort. There's just a lot of them out there. Um, that said, there does seem to be uh, a particular interest in Vue, uh, Vue.js. Um, this is just one of numerous charts you can find that show basically the same trend lines. Uh, that's, uh, the, the order there is uh, React is on the top, the middle guy is Vue, and the last one is Angular. And basically you see, I mean obviously adoption is growing for all these front-end frameworks, but it is growing the slowest for Angular. Uh, Angular has a lot of built-in adoption, um, just because it's been around longer than the others. Uh, React is more or less on top these days, um, the way I look at it, look at it. but the interest in, in Vue is very much spiking. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of people are really interested in, in uh, the Vue framework, and uh, I speculate that a lot of that is actually happening from folks who are uh, growing uh, uncomfortable with Angular uh, for whatever reason, but that's just my speculation. Um, I'll mention as we start looking at some of the code, I, I think Vue in many ways is, uh, appeals more to folks who are accustomed to using Angular uh, versus folks who are using React, but that's neither here nor there. So Vue uh, was released in 2014, so it is a uh, fairly new framework, uh, newest of the big three, um, and the current major release came out in 2016. Um, the inventor, and uh, still the lead developer, um, for Vue.js. Um, I don't remember if he actually worked for Google, but he was an Angular um, uh, contributor and developer. 
And so the simplest way to, des to describe view is that it's, it's a, it, it lands right in the middle of a spectrum with Angular on one side and React on the other. And if you're not familiar with any of these JavaScript frameworks, um, Angular is by far the most full-featured of, of these three. Um, the, it gives you the most functionality. It also brings the most compl complexity of, of the three. And React would be most simple. Um, there are simpler frameworks than React. There are probably more complex frameworks than Angular. But that is the, that, that, you know, they, those two are on opposite ups, uh, ends of that spectrum. Uh, React is trying to give, is, tr is emphasizing, emphasizing simplicity, maybe at the expense of, of developer productivity at times, uh, at least in some folks' opinion. And Vue is literally right in the middle, uh, right in the, in, in the middle uh, between, those, between the, the two. And um, that can be an appealing place to be. And I think it does carve out a, a, a niche for itself there. Um, it really does emphasize developer productivity. It's not going to make you do extra work just to stay in line with some sort of greater programming paradigm. Um, at the same time, it is uh, generally simpler and more uh, focused in its intentions um, than Angular uh, might be. It is a view library, as the name might suggest. Um, and that's an important distinction. Um, a lot of times pe people co will compare things like, for example, React and Angular and they'll do kind of feature by feature comparisons, and it's not really fair. Angular is a framework. Uh, React is not a framework. Vue is not a framework, although it edges more that direction. Um, it, uh, uh, React and Vue are considered libraries, uh, and they really are focused on rendering of views and not much else. Um, they don't necessarily help you with state management. They don't help you with AJAX requests. That's just not their, their job. Um, Angular, on the other hand, is more likely to give you a solution for, for those kinds of problems out of the box. It has a, it's a very performant. Perf I put an asterisk there because performance is one of these things. All the JavaScript framework frameworks are leapfrogging each other, and um, I, I can't say which one's faster any given week. Um, the, there was a brief period of time where I think Vue was ahead on some metrics of React, and then React 16 came out, and it was faster than everybody, and I'm sure that everyone will keep getting faster over time. Uh, it has a very full-featured API. Um, it, it gives you a lot of uh, helper, hel helper methods and... and um, conventions that you can follow, uh, again, emphasizing productivity. The ecosystem, I say, is mature, which is, I, I say with a caveat, I mean, it's new. However, there is pretty much a accepted um, library or solution for all the potential, like I say, view, view is a library, and so it leaves certain areas, or, um, leaves you on your own in certain areas, but there's almost always an a official or at least recognized, uh, un unofficially recognized as official uh, solution or tool for all those areas, which I find pretty nice. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's, it can be confusing, especially in, uh, in the React world, which is where I do a lot of my front-end work, um, where there's two or three viable options for every solution, and that just becomes confusing after a while. It's nice when there's a, something that everyone basically recognizes, this is compatible, this does the job, and has com good community support. So Vue is more in that line. The dev tools for Vue are excellent, um, and the community is very active, and it's being actively developed. So there's a lot of momentum behind uh, the devel development of this library. So you can get started playing with Vue uh, most simply by installing it from, from NPM. Now, you can simply drop a, a script tag in an HTML file, and in fact, we'll be looking at what that looks like in just a second here. Um, but typically, if you're going to actually try to build a project with Vue, you're not going to want to use a script tag. Um, so you can install, install from NPM, and if you really just want to play with it and actually get an app going and start messing around, I'd highly recommend you uh, install the Vue CLI and use that to generate your project. Um, there's several templates that are available, and if you just want to totally get started, you can use the, uh, the uh, simple, aptly named simple, te sim simple template. So the command is there on the slide, view init, template name, and then the name of your project. And then it goes all the way up to the Webpack template, which is a full-featured project with separate configurations for development, test, and build, envi uh, production environments, and uh, test suite, and all that kind of good stuff. But uh, don't, don't look at that if you're brand new to the framework, because it will be overwhelming. <laughs> um, I shouldn't say don't look at it, but I, I would not recommend that as a start for, for, uh, for learning. So this is basically the absolute simplest uh, view app you can put together. This is, like I said, using a script tag, so you can just drop this exact code on any HTML file and it will work. Um, I'm going to explain more detail what's going on in the, the particulars uh, of this example because this is very much 
a hello world, most apps you would write with Vue will not really look like this. That's why I don't want to get too caught up explaining the details. But basically, you can see that we, it does have this idea of a template, um, that div there at the top with the ID of app. It's got a little a double, double curly brace there, so you can do some expressions inside of that syntax. Uh, and then the actual uh, component, or, or the, um, uh, the precise term would be instance of Vue being set up there, um, is just a matter of setting, uh, assigning a var to a new Vue instance. You pass it an object. That object is going to configure the behavior and potentially the data of that view instance. And I'll explain the difference between instances and components uh, as we get along. But um, that's, that's basically the, the core of a view app right there. You've got an instance. You pass it an object of options. And that the, those options are going to include any methods that you're going to want to call in your component or in your template. It's going to include um, uh, lifecycle hooks, which are methods that get called when the component is first created and when the component is destroyed and so forth. All that, uh, all the real API and functionality of you ends up going inside, or not all of it, but most of it ends up going inside of that object. And we'll see what that looks like uh, right now. So an inst a view instance, it's a, um, a it acts a, in fact, you can think of it as a class, and that, that's not technically, I think, the way it, it works in uh, plain JavaScript. But, um, oops, sorry. Uh, you pass it an, inst uh, an object that I've heard called an instance definition. So that's what I call it. The, the object that you pass in there, plain JavaScript object, I call it the instance definition. I'm, I'm not really clear what the official name of that thing is. Um, and like I said, th there, there is a distinction between instance and a component. And for now, basically, a component is a view instance that is being imported into some up something else. Th that makes it a component. And so there are some semantic differences between a plain view instance, which you create with new view, and that's what you're likely going to do for your app, for the very top level of your, of your um, application uh, structure, versus other components that don't really get instantiated on their own. They're imported and used inside of someone else's template. We'll see what that looks like as we go along. Um, but both, whether it's a component, it's, it still is an instance, and it still accepts this object of, of properties that configure how the instance behaves. So we're going to look through some of the properties um, that we can work with. So the first obvious one is uh, L, element. It's just telling Vue where to render um, its, its template. So again, this is mostly going to happen once. You're not going to typically have a lot of, of, in, of instances of Vue that rent. You could. You could have more, multiple instances and render them di to different places. But typically, you're going to have something like you see up there, a, a div that's, that represents your app. And you're going to render your uh, components starting at that point. And if you're done anything with React, um, this is very similar to, to how that works uh, with the React DOM render call. You just got to give the framework somewhere to start, and then it takes over from there. Uh, probably one of the most interesting properties of a view instance is data. Data is simply where internal state for the, the, the uh, view instance is stored. And again, instance, that includes components. So at this point, those terms are almost interchangeable. Um, the properties within the data, so data is an object. So data will be the key, and if you can see the next example here. Uh, data is the key, and following that key, it, that is the object of the actual uh, state. Um, all the properties in the data object are reactive. Um, and by reactive, it mean, uh, sorry, I shouldn't say they're reactive. They, they are reactively rendered. So whenever they change, um, any usages of that data property in your templates will also change. Um, so for example, uh, this uh, first data object, we have uh, my value with a, a number of three. If that number is changed by anything, any, any method or whatever that's going to change that number, what, as soon as it changes, any usage of my value in a template is going to be updated. And that uh, update goes both ways, uh, which means it can be updated both in the template, and that will be, that'll update the data back in the component or in the instance. And if it's updated in the instance, it will update in the template. So it supports both one and two way data binding. Again, if you're familiar with the differences between React and Angular, that, that's a key difference. Um, Angular now does support both one and two-way binding, but React does not. React only supports one-way binding. So with a React component, you can make changes to the data, and it will be, it, it will be reflected in the template or in, in the, uh, the render method, but the other way around does not work. You cannot just arbitrarily change the value of your data from within the, the template. Uh, in Vue, you can, but there are different semantics, so you have to be explicit which way you're going, if you're going to be using two-way bi data binding or if you're going to do things one way. 
And I'm pretty sure we'll actually see that uh, both ways uh, in our demo. So uh, methods. Oh, one more thing about the data object. Um, I think I have this on the slide. I just didn't mention it. Uh, you can add properties to your data object after the application is started. However, they will not be subject to the, to the re-rendering process. That means if you were to add a property to this object here on the left, if you were to add you know, my second value, and then you make changes to that, to that object, it, it will not, those changes will not affect your template. So you really want to make sure that your initial object, when you create a component or, a t or, a, or an instance, um, you want to make sure that all of the properties you intend to use are already there, even if they're just set to null or an empty string or whatever. But you need them there um, at the time when the component is created. Um, one other thing to notice is that the difference between um, this view instance on the left and the uh, component on the right, you can see on the left side, data is simply the key with an object as the value. Whereas on the, on the other side, on the component version, data is a function. And that's a, a, an important difference. And, uh, um, and what, this, what this has to do with is the fact that components, they're not instantiated like um, an instance is, right? You don't create new component. They're imported into potentially multiple places within your application. You can use the same component anywhere in your uh, component hierarchy. And uh, because of the way that Vue does the uh, reactive rendering, if you were to create an, a, a component with an object representing its data, that would actually, you would end up having the same object. The object would only be created once. The component could be used in multiple places, but there would be one data object and they would all be pointing to the same object. A little bit confusing, and you don't really need to worry about it because you won't let you do that. It's just not allowed. Um, in order to get around that, though, components use a data function. So that function, you can see, returns basically the exact same object we were talking about. So rather than just setting it as the, the key to the data, the, as the value to the data key, we have a data function that returns the whole object. Um, and, and in practice, if you're writing a lot of components, you're going to see the example on the, on the right hand more often. So it can take a little bit of getting used to when you're uh, getting started, but oh, um, as, as once you start working with it, it's, it's not that, that bad of a distinction. Okay, the other, uh, and in a, another interesting property is called methods. Uh, between data and methods, you're going to get maybe 80% of the functionality you're going to want in your components. Uh, the methods uh, is simply an object containing all the methods that your component needs to, in order to function. So methods are just plain functions. They have access to the data. Um, so you can refer to, like th this example here, where it, we are uh, toggling the value of a this.showLinks. So this.showLinks is going to refer to the show links. Um, property in our data, if we have one, and um, that's uh, that's about all there is to it. You can have as many methods as you want. You can call them whatever you like, and you can use them from within your templates. You can also use them from within other other methods. Computed properties. This is these go under the computed uh, property, a computed key in that instance definition. And the interesting thing about these is that they are. You access them as though they were simply state variables in your data. However, they're actually dynamic. As you can see, the, the example here, we have a number uh, property, and it's a function, and it performs a basic calculation. Now, the cool thing about this, so here we're, we're, uh, we're, that we have a number, and we take two, and we add it to our this.first number state variable, right? So you might wonder, what's the difference between doing this and just making a method? Well, the difference, and the, the cool thing about this is that Computer properties, um, they, cache their, uh, they, they, they uh, cache the results and they only return a new value if one of the dependent properties that they use changes. So in this example here, um, the first time you refer to the number property, it's going to run that little calculation. But every subsequent time, it's simply going to return the value that it got last time until somebody changes this dot first number. When this dot first number changes, it's going to recalculate. And this is a trivial example, but you could potentially, computer properties could potentially have some significant amount, you know, non-trivial amount of, of work going on. And so the ability to only recompute those properties as needed um, is something that is, is actually, I mean, you, you can't do that in, in React, for example, with, without you know, manually you know, put, uh, doing some sort of caching um, on, your, on, your, on your own. So it's, it's cool that Vue gives, us, gives us this to you right out of the box. Lifecycle hooks. Um, these are simply methods that are called by view at certain stages in the lifecycle of your instance and um, of your component. 
and there are a bunch of life cycles. These are all the, this, is, this uh, chart is from the documentation, and it gives you the, um, on the, the red outlined boxes there, those are the potential hooks that you can implement yourself on any, on any given component. You don't have to implement any of them. You can implement any ones, any, which ones interest, that interest you. There's a few more there. So you've got um, hooks for when the component is mounted. Notice they can be created at one point, but maybe not actually rendered and not viewable yet, and so it's not mounted to the, to the DOM at that point. So you have hooks for all that, and as well as you know, doing any cleanup in the before destroy or destroyed uh, lifecycle hooks. So you can learn about the details of those in the documentation, but you have access to all that. And then we have templates. So um, Vue uses a HTML-based templating uh, syntax. It's plain HTML, so it's not using JSX, although JSX can be used, which is interesting um, for people that know about React, uh, and they have, they have their own kind of XML hybrid, XML JavaScript hybrid that they call JSX, and that's the way you uh, render out templates in React. You can use that with Vue, uh, which is interesting. It actually follows a very similar rendering model to React. Uh, but by default, it doesn't use that. It just uses HTML-based uh, uh, templates. It uses the double curly bar or mustache sy syntax for expressions and for accessing values in your, in your uh, state. Uh, it has directives, just like Angular. Um, they're prefixed with V um, instead of ng. So instead of ng4 or ng if, you have v4 and v if. And um, they, they accept arguments, modifiers, uh, a lot of the same things that uh, directives in Angular support. And like React, uh, Vue does its rendering bait uh, with a virtual DOM. It uh, creates a rendering chain where it's, it's effectively a giant lit, uh, chain of uh, create element calls. And um, rather than rent, so what happens is any time there's a change in, in the data of a component, everything beneath that component, any components that it imports, anything coming after that component in your, in your tree, um, all of those components are going to be re-rendered. Re but they're not re-rendered in reality. They're re-rendered virtually in an in-memory representation of the DOM. So basically, Vue is taking a snapshot of your page, of your app, uh, from the browser, making changes to it in memory, and then performing a diff to, dis to figure out what things need to actually change. So that might be a substantial amount of rendering done in memory, but that's not nearly as time consuming as performing the actual rendering operations in, in the DOM. This is exactly the same approach that React takes and one of the reasons why React is quite performant um, and Vue takes advantage of the, of the same approach. And in fact, the API for, for Vue uh, for doing that is, is almost identical to React. And this is what a template looks like. So you can see it's basic HTML. You got the double curly braces uh, for putting in values. You can see down there, I, should, I don't have a laser pointer with me, but you can see down there kind of in the bottom third where we have an author, uh, an option with an author name in there. You can see several directives being used, uh, and we'll look at those more in the, in the demo. Um, and, but for the most part, it's the, the templating um, syntax, because it's just straight HTML, it's quite easy to get used to. Um, it's not, there's not nearly, nearly, there's definitely not the gotchas that you have with React, for example. And I'm not mean to hit on React, I mean, I, I, I enjoy React, and it's actually my preferred uh, JavaScript framework these days, but, or library, library these days, but this is definitely more friendly uh, when you're learning. And um, directives, it's a little more detail there. You've got all the, all the control logic, the ifs, the else's. Um, if you've done a lot of GSP development, you know, you've got those kind of, you might call them custom tags, that are, but they're just attributes um, that you'd expect. You have stuff for iteration, you can hide and show elements. Um, down at the bottom there is an interesting bit of uh, shortcut uh, syntactic sugar that's kind of nice. You'll see that the first example, we have a vbind colon value. So vbind is the directive. Colon means we're going to pass an argument to that directive, and the argument is value. So what we're telling uh, view here is we want to bind something to the value attribute on this input, right? So input value, we want to bind something to that. Um, and then in the, in the value of that attribute, we can now we're supplying a, a, a JavaScript object, right? So maybe we're iterating over an author or something. We're supplying the author ID to the value of this input. Now, if you look at the example on that same line, the example on the right-hand side, you'll see that um, we can actually truncate this and get rid of the vbind and simply prefix the attribute with the colon. And that's because when you start doing any significant amount of work with templates in view, you end up saying vbind and the, the, cor uh, the corresponding one for events uh, v on, you end up doing those two a lot, 
right? Because you're, you're, you're binding values to elements, you're binding methods, behavior to elements, you know, on-click events, on-change events, and so forth. You do that a lot, and so the, the, they provide shortcuts for both of those. So with vbind, you can use the colon prefix. So you, you basically just prefix whatever attribute you want to bind to with the colon. And then with the, uh, um, the von for event handling, you use the at symbol, and you use at and then the na name of the event you want to handle. So there's at click, there's at touch, there's at mouse up, mouse down. All the events that you're used to are all available, and that's a shortcut for how you, how you work with them. And um, I, I typically use the shortcut syntax because it is get tedious to be writing the exact same prefix every time. So components, I already kind of mentioned this. Uh, components are just their view instances, but they're instances that are being imported, and they, they have... Um, they have a, a template that is not rendered, it's, it's rendered by the parent, not by themselves. So they're, 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 more, they're, they're basically designed to be children in a component hierarchy. Um, like I said, it, it works uh, with create, the create element API, just like React, which is why JSX actually works, because JSX um, is actually just a DSL, really, for JavaScript, for creating, uh, create, creating elements. Um, and so, uh, because uh, view uses the same basic API, it's compatible with the JSX. I'm, I call it a DSL because for me as a, as a Grails and Groovy guy, that makes sense. Um, it's not strictly speaking a DSL perhaps, but that's, that's how it ha functions. Um, components are usually uh, put together in, in something called a single file component in Vue. And um, that's, that's what, what you end up writing most, when you write a, a Vue application, most of your code is going to go into this, this thing called a single file component. A single file component is a file with a .view extension, and it has three top-level elements. It has a template, a script, and a style. Let me show you what it looks like. That's about the simplest component you can put together. So this is something, again, it's not where you're, this is not how you're going to create your main app. This is how you're going to create components that you'll import into your app, and you'll import into other components and use to build your application. Most of your code will end up in files like this, so it's worth uh, taking note. Uh, you've got a template, which is where your HTML-based templating stuff goes. You've got a script, and the script typically is just going to be exporting a JavaScript object or a JavaScript module um, that has the same properties we've been talking about, right? Data, methods, computer properties. All that stuff's going to go in this object that's being um, exported. Um, you're not, you could put other JavaScript in that script. It's, it's just script tags. You could put whatever you want in there, but you probably should you know, stick with the, within the bounds of the API. And then finally, a style section, which is CSS. And uh, you can include the scope attribute. I'm not really clear if you need the scope attribute. I, it, it's included by default when you use the CLI, so I kind of think it is, it is required. But the idea there is the CSS in this component will only apply to the template for this component, right? So we've got an H1 tag here in our template. We're setting the color to blue. Uh, we can have other templates that have other, styles, other CSS rules, and they're not going to interfere. They're all going to be scoped to the... Uh, template that, uh, for their own component. Like I said, most of the code you write when you're doing Vue.js stuff is going to be in, in files like this. And they can be much larger than this, obviously, but this is um, the basic format. Now, the, the catch, though, when you start doing this kind of style of uh, component, you can't just put the script tag in your, HTML, in your HTML file and start playing with components like this because browsers don't know how to read .view files. So when you use .view files, you do have to use some sort of a build tool to process them. And um, generally speaking, if you're using the Vue CLI, you don't have to worry about that because it sets it up for you. It's all based on, on uh, the Webpack bundler uh, build tool. But um, it does have to be processed. Browsers don't know how to read those files, obviously. OK, so uh, we're about to get into the, into the code here. Just a, a couple slides on how we, how we use a Vue with Grails. Um, I'm not going to go through all this. This is just. Reasons why I think Grails is still a good fit for a backend for single page applications, like the kind you might build with Vue.js. It's a great uh, RESTful backend. It, we have GORM, we have JSON views, uh, we have lots of great plugins. Uh, Spring Security plugin, I think, is really a compelling, uh, a compelling resource that you don't get when you leave Grails. So there's a lot of good reasons to, to still choose it. So if you're in my talk yesterday, I went over what I consider to be the three basic approaches to using a JavaScript framework with Grails. Um, it, it, you can use the asset pipeline if, you, if the asset pipeline supports your preferred framework. That one's out in this case. The, there's not yet v, uh, support for Vue in the asset pipeline. Um, maybe there's, if there's more interest, we might see that happen. 
but that's one of the, the downsides with the asset pipeline is that there can be a bit of a lag um, between when a new framework kind of catches on and when we actually get support for it. So there's the asset pipeline. We can't really use that here. There's the hybrid web app, which is basically um, a, 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 um, a, merging of a, a merging of two projects into one. You're taking what is essentially an independent JavaScript project, be it, be it in React or Angular or whatever, and you're putting it inside of the Gradle's project, and you're using Gradle and Gradle's node integration to kind of uh, tie the two together. So that when you build your Grails application, the JavaScript is also processed and able to be delivered to the web application. And this is good because it lets you use um, React components, for example, inside of a GSP page. Right? Maybe, maybe you aren't ready to write a single page application. Maybe you just want to use um, components or uh, for, um, for uh, or rather, maybe you want to use JavaScript for subcomponents within your uh, GSP pages, your GSP views. So, and there's other advantages to doing this. I mean, if you're building a standalone monolithic application um, and you're not really looking to split things up, um, that's a reasonable approach. Um, you could do this with Vue. I have not put together, so I've written profiles for a, a couple of, of these approaches, and I have not yet done one for Vue, uh, but I could. And you could take a look at the, the React-Webpack profile, which does exactly this, and um, take a look at that, and you could swap out React for Vue, and it would probably work. Uh, yeah, it would work. Um, but the approach we're going to talk about today is the one on the bottom, the multi-project build. And this is, I consider, to be the most flexible way of doing things. And basically, the idea is, is we're going to have a standalone front-end project. In this case, it's going to be Vue. And the Grails project uh, will be uh, the back-end. It'll be its own sub-project within a Gradle build. This is what that kind of looks like. So we've got, uh, and, th and this is what the um, Vue profile that we're going to be using, uh, this is exactly what it gives you. Um, and yeah, there it is. So you can create a project right now with Grails Create App um, Profile View, and it will give you exactly the project structure we were just looking at over here. It'll give you a multi-project build with a server project and a client project. The server project will be a Grails application built with the REST API profile. So that means there will not be any GSP views. It's going to be set up to use JSON views by default, um, which is ideal for exposing um, your, your data over a REST API. And then the um, client project is going to be built with the Vue CLI. And the only real customization is the, the Vue app is it's themed to match the Grails application. And it also is um, interacting with the back end through a, um, a REST call. Um, in fact, that, that home page right there, that's exactly what you would see if you were to use the profile. So you can see that it's, we still have the um, application metadata that you typically would see on the Grails project home page when you create a brand new app. But it's not, instead of, those, uh, instead of that data being passed from a controller to a GSP, it's being exposed as a RESTful endpoint, and um, the Vue app is retrieving that and displaying it in its user interface. So the Grails application, like I said, using the REST API profile, it is cores enabled, which is literally a single configuration property these days. So it's not all that impressive, but it's, it's there, ready for you. And then on the, the, the client side, the uh, Vue project is using the Vue CLI. It's got, a, uh, it's got a, a rest, the, the REST call set up in order to make that call back to the, the Grails application, so you can see how that looks right away. And it has a custom theme, like I said. So typically, the way you would uh, play with the Vue CLI project is through um, NPM, uh, the node, well, the thing that does not stand for Node Package Manager, because for some reason there's sticklers about that, but it, um, it's uh, basically the, the dependency management and a build tool uh, for Node.js based projects, and that is what the Vue CLI is. So you can run the project with npm start, you can run npm test to run the tests, and you can build a production version of the assets with npm build. However, we also have the uh, Gradle node plugin installed. I mentioned this a little bit earlier. And that means that instead of calling npm, maybe you're, if, if you haven't done much in Node.js, you might not, not have npm installed, um, you can actually use Gradle uh, commands. Um, for all those um, same, same tasks. So you can just use Gradle, or the Gradle wrapper, of course, is included. And you can say client colon start, referring to the client subproject and the start npm script. And you know, all, all the same uh, t tasks are available to you using Gradle instead of npm. And the other benefits of this is that um, this, uh, the plugin will help you. It standardizes your node version. You specify your node version in, the, in your build.gradle file. And so everybody who uses the project is automatically using the same version of Node. 
Um, it installs the version of Node locally to the project. So you can have projects using different versions of Node, and they're not going to get confused or conflict with each other. And it handles both NPM and also Yarn and, and a bunch of other things um, that, you, uh, that you might find useful. So typically, you can start things up. So because it's separate projects, um, you have to start them separately. So you can start up the Grails application like you normally would with uh, uh, Grails run app or Gradle boot run. And then you, secondarily, you can start up the um, uh, Vue.js app with the start command, either npm start or Gradle start, uh, client start, rather. And um, the client will run on localhost 3000 by default. The uh, Grails app will be on um, good old port 8080. That's one gotcha. If you use the Vue CLI by itself, for some reason, they default to port 8080. Um, which is, I've never seen a JavaScript framework do that except for Vue. Um, so I had to change that in the profile because obviously we can't have both servers running, running on the same port. Uh, you can start these two together. You can use Gradle's uh, parallel mode to start both the front and back end um, in, uh, together. I found that it'd be not, it's cool when it works, but it's not very practical because often you find out you need to kill one server and not necessarily both. Um, I just I haven't found the parallel mode to be super compelling, but it, is, um, it, it does work. Okay, so demo. So I'm going to cheat a little bit here with this demo in that um, I've actually done all the code changes and I'm going to be stepping through them in, uh, with Git rather than um, coding that because th there's a lot of things changing in different places um, in this demo and this I just found this to be a little more dependable. It also has the advantage that you can look at the code later on and you can follow step by step um, the changes I was making and compare the differences and I, I think this is more useful than if I just give you a completed project and you, you don't get to see the iteration. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn mirroring on. There we go. You should be able to see my screen now. Okay. So I'll up the font size a little bit. I will also zoom in sp on specific uh, piece of code as I, as I work on it. For some reason, I can never remember the uh, command to increase the font size. Is it just command plus? No, okay, it's not. All right, so bear with me here. I'm just upping the font size a bit. I can remember where that is. There we go. How's that apply? How's that? Is that, is that workable? Okay, great. So let's go ahead and put these away for now. All right. So this is basically uh, what you're going to see. Hopefully, this is okay. Great. I've had some projectors that don't handle uh, Max the, the OS 10 zoom very well. So this is the basic project structure. We have our client project, which is going to be uh, the from the view CLI, and then we have the uh, server project, which is a, which is a Grails uh, REST API app. And um, at this point, really nothing special. This is exactly pretty much what you would get um, if you were to create the application from uh, Grails Create App or from the application Forge. Um, but we'll go ahead and start it up anyway so we can see what that looks like. So we'll go ahead and start up the server. Got to jump over here, start up the client. Notice I'm using the Gradle task right for this, the client start. Um, I just find that cleaner than doing it with NPM. Um, it works pretty well. So while that's starting up, the Grails application starting up over here. After playing with Micronaut, I will admit, both of these seem kind of slow. <laughs> it's, it's, like it's, it's odd that a Java framework is starting up faster than even my front-end um, code now. Uh, not JavaScript, a JVM framework. All right, here we are. So there's the Grails application. You see REST API profile. Or actually, this is the, the view profile, but you can see it's, it's just exposing um, a RESTful output, a uh, JSON output. Um, so hopefully by now, yep, there's our localhost 3000. There we go. So that is the home page. So you can see it's, it's themed to look like the Grails home page. Um, there's nothing really fancy about that. Um, but it's based functionally the same as what you get with a, the Grails GSP version. So it's uh, making a REST call. We're going to take a quick look at that. I don't want to spend too long on this because we're going to actually do our own coding here. But uh, we'll get to see what the welcome component looks like. Mostly HTML. <coughs> One of the big, big, big benefits of having an HTML-based syntax, I found, as opposed to React, is that you can just copy and paste your HTML, and it works. And then you can add in whatever um, uh, JavaScript bits you want uh, from there. Whereas with um, React, you end up having to tweak the, the HTML to make it work as JSX. Um, so yep, yeah, here it is. So here we're, we're saying, if we have server info, so this 
um, list here will not be rendered if we don't have server info. If we do, we'll use the vif uh, directive to iterate over our controllers. And actually, sorry, if we have controllers, we'll use v4 to iterate over our controllers. Sorry, misspoke that. Notice here um, we're binding. We're using that shorthand to bind a value to the key. Now, there's no key attribute in HTML, but um, Vue does read a key attribute, and it uses that to um, when you have whenever anytime you're iterating and creating a list of elements, buttons or list elements, uh, whatever they are, um, you want a key so that Vue can more efficiently handle updates to specific elements in that list. Um, I don't know if Vue actually requires it, but if you don't use it, it will give you a warning. Um, so here, uh, another example, we're binding something to the href attribute on our uh, anchor tag, and anything inside, when, when, whenever you, you use a directive, anything inside the value of that directive, this is JavaScript, right? So if, if you're not used to playing with JavaScript frameworks, this might look a little weird because you're used to thinking of this just being a string or, or maybe you can put in some sort of uh, uh, expression, but this is just, uh, you write JavaScript within the quotation marks and it just works. So we're just concatenating our server URL with our controller name and it all works like, like uh, you'd expect it to. Um, this is where we're doing the uh, Ajax call. So this, uh, f this uh, call to fetch. Fetch is a new, newer JavaScript API for um, making um, HTTP requests. And um, so it's not something specific to view. Um, and I, I prefer it over using another library to make Ajax calls. Um, so we're making a, a GET request uh, by default to the app slash application. So that's the application controller on the Grail side. And then we're parsing uh, the JSON response, and we're assigning the JSON to our server info. And we can take a quick look at what that looks like. If we inspect our element and go to the network tab, refresh this, we catch it. There it is. There is our, our request to slash application. Look at our response. And I'm using Firefox, so it renders all the JSON in a pretty format. But this is just a JSON response. That's what I got back. So that's all out of, the out of the box, and it all works. Let's go ahead and start making some changes. So the very first thing we're going to do, our step one, is actually going to be to blow away the, the part of the view app that is specific to the, 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 the view profile for Grails. So we're actually going to go and see what the plain vanilla view CLI looks like. And um, I did that because, like I said, this, originally I was presenting this to uh, front-end audiences who were not really interested in seeing a, a Grails UI. So. Um, but it's worth checking out because it's a, it's a simpler um, template. So we'll go ahead and force checkout of step one. Oh, the other thing we do with step one is we add a bit of a domain model on the Grail side. So let's take a look at that first, actually. Uh, nothing fancy here. We've added two uh, domain classes, author and book. Both of them are using the app resource annotation. Hopefully we're all familiar with that, um, in included in the Grail's RESTful stuff. So by def the, we're, the defaults work for us in this case. We could specify an alternate URL for the, the generated RESTful controller. We could specify the format and all kinds of good stuff, but uh, we're not going to do that uh, here because this, um, it would just complicate the demo. Um, yep, that's about all there is to it. So this, uh, this uh, um, API should be exposed. It might even be, I wonder if it reloaded. Oh, no, I do not want to start Outlook right now. Please don't do that. Okay, let's see if it um, loaded those controllers. I'm not sure if it, it'll pick that up from the, the Git checkout. No, it didn't. Okay. So we're going to have to restart the server. Not a big deal. Well, it will be a big deal if IntelliJ just decides to die on me. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so something, something went wrong there. but That's all right. It's kind of asking a lot to expect the, the, the reloading to work. For the, in fact, I don't, yeah, it doesn't even work on the front end. So whenever you change the world underneath uh, one of these running servers, they don't tend to like it. All right, so the Grails one's starting up. The view one is now starting up. So we'll see what this looks like. So now we're going to have a basic RESTful API for books and authors on the Grail side. Um, and of course, you know, the resource annotation is mostly just convenience for me. It's not, you know, we could have our custom controllers and that would doesn't really matter as long as we're exposing some meaningful endpoints to the front end that we can play with. Let's see if this came up yet. It says it did, but I don't see anything yet. Here it is. Okay. So like I said, basically this just stripped out all the Grail theming, and this is what you get from Vue CLI by itself. Um, nothing particularly interesting there. Uh, in fact, probably has less to really look at, but let's see if there's anything 
we want to see is it, is it hello world? What they call it? Yeah, there's hello world. So this is their default. Same idea though, right? It's a single file component. So it's got a template. Oh, that's the thing I should highlight. So notice this is a, a single file component, right? It's got a template. Let me collapse these so you can see them. Template, script, style. Um, this will not work by itself. And so it has to be processed, and the view CLI will do that for you. But in addition, it has to be imported. You can't just render an app from a single component like this. You need to import it into something. And so let's take a look at where that's happening. It is happening within the, um, not there, here. So this uh, right here is where the, the top level view instance is being created, right? This is where we have an element prop uh, property uh, for um, app. Now, this is the HTML file is not here, right? So the HTML, the, the, there is an HTML file. We'll look at it in a, in a second. But this is the JavaScript file that the, HT, that, that the um, HTML file will import and, and ex execute in the browser. And so this is where everything's going to start. When it creates the new view instance, it's going to render it to the app, I, uh, app the element with an ID of app, and it's going to start off with the, this single template right here uh, that just has the app component. And the app component is the top level component of our component hierarchy, but it can't be rendered by itself. It's got to be rendered um, through a, a, a new view instance like this right here. Um, so if we take a look at that HTML file, which I believe lives under, oh, here it is. Yeah. Um, okay, well. The CLI is injecting the, the, the JavaScript file, so I can't show you that, but this is the, this is the div where um, all the rendering starts. And we can prove that if we put in h1 right here and say, that, there. So it's just plain HTML file. So uh, the, the build tool, the, 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 the view CLI build stuff is sticking the JavaScript in there for you uh, when you start up the app. So well, that's not very interesting because we have an API now and we would like to use that API. So let's go ahead and jump up here. We're going to start building out um, a bit of a UI to interact with uh, the book and authors that we were just um, playing with. So at this point, we'll start looking at things a little, more, a little more closely as we have time. Oh, we don't have time. We have two minutes? Two minutes. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. Like I said, this is a, I have a lot of material that I could go through here. Um, so hopefully we can get through at least this next step, though. So um, what we've done here is we've created a, another top, a single file component, template, script, and styles. Um, this component has a data function. And we've simply hard-coded some data that we want to use to kind of flesh out a skeleton of our UI. Um, and the, the template here is using a book list component. So we'll take a look at that real quick. Oops. There we go. Um, Where's book list? Here it is. Oh, we're in it. So book list is a, another, the template's simply a table. It's iterating over a bunch of books. Those books are supplied to the book list, if you look up here. So we have the, the little colon here where we are uh, binding the books object, which is our data down here. We're binding that to a book attribute on our book list component. That attribute or prop is defined right here. So that's the, the attribute that we are binding the data to. So we're basically saying, Table, here's a list of books, and now you can take and run with it. And so the table iterates over those uh, with a, our custom book component, and the book component is simply rendering the table row that has the actual value uh, properties for the book. So we take a look at that. Oh, sorry, there. There is our list of books. But that's not very interesting because it's not talking to our API. So um, let's jump right to the next step. All right. And now, if we go back here in our home component, we've added a created function. It's the lifecycle hook again. This is the one that gets called when the component is first created. This is basically the same sort of fetch call we were just looking at in the previous example, so I won't go over it again, except now we are fetching from our book controller on the Grail side. And um, we are passing. So now when we start off, we have no books initially. This dot books equals JSON. This is where we assign the response from the API to the local state variable. And at that point, the app basically works like it did before. Nothing else had to change. Um, we just needed to retrieve the data from the API. And oh, it's already there. So the, the, it is set up with hot reloading, the view application. So um, whatever we make a change, we don't have to refresh the page. The changes are refreshed uh, automatically um, for us. And so this, the, this is the data. If we go over here and look at the book API call, 
there's the data from the API, so some stuff I threw into Bootstrap. Same data here. Okay. Um, let me jump to the last one, probably. Okay, so now we've got things that got a little more interesting. Um, we've still got our basic um, book component. We've got our book list component. We've added some event handling, but I really want to look at the uh, form. So this is how to create. So now we have a form for creating new books. Um, so let's see if this, hopefully this works here. Um, And unfortunately, I don't have the author's UI set up yet, so we can't add any authors. There we go. So I just added a new book, refresh the page. It's still there, so the data has persisted. Uh, there's a glitch there. It's not loading the number of pages. Um, but we'll, I think I know what the problem was there, and I'm going to ignore it for now. Um, so a couple things I wanted to point out. So I mentioned how uh, Vue has both one-way and two-way data binding, and I wanted to show that works. So when we, have, uh, when we do something like this with the colon and the, value and the, and the attribute, this is one-way data binding. We can set the value this way, but it will not be changed. In, if we change it in the element, it will not change in the data. If you want to change it both ways, if you want two-way binding, you can get it. You get it using the vModel directive. So what vModel does is it says, I want the, the model for this um, element to match whatever is in the data with the same, you, the same property. I want those two properties to be in sync. They can change on the back end in the, in the component's data. They can be changed by the user if they're typing in a new value, for example. So in, in this example here, we're saying that whatever the user is typing into the, 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 this text input, we want that same value to be stored in our, our data book title property. So that's how you get two-way data binding um, uh, in view. It's you, it, you have bo both options, but you have to be explicit about it, which I think is, is really cool. Um, anything else here I want to point out? Here's the event handling. So this is calling a, function, a method called add book. And passing, so book here is going to refer to a book object in our state variable. Whenever you refer to a property just by itself within a template, it's going to automatically associate with a property in your state. So if we command click on book, there's book. So we start off with an empty object, but as the user types things in, those properties are being updated. If you use the dev tools, the, the view uh, dev tools for your preferred browser, you can actually watch those changes happen. It's kind of cool. Um, now notice we're calling an add book. Um, method here, but there's no add book method in our form. Instead, we have a prop called add book. So add book is actually a function being passed into our form. The form itself doesn't know how to make a rest call to persist the book, but it's being given a function that can do just that. And um, we can see where that function is defined. It's being defined back in the home component uh, right up here. So this is making a post request to our Grails API. And um, assuming everything goes um, as planned, and we get a 201, uh, 201 response, we will push the new book into our state. And that means we don't have to refresh the whole list. We can just add the new, the new item at the end of the list. And the corresponding delete function, which is also passed in um, as a prop to, that, to the uh, table component, is just doing the reverse. Does the delete call if the delete succeeded? it reassigns the value of books by filtering out the deleted um, book. And the, uh, if we take a look at that, pretty sure it works. We can just delete a book, and it disappears. And if we refresh, it's gone. So we deleted it. OK, that's all I have time for. Um, there, there's more in the repo. And like I said, it's all stepped out logically, step by step, so you can go through and, and um, see all the remaining changes. There's some more stuff here. I use um, uh, View Router to do routing um, within the View application. It uses UX for state management. So um, please do check out the code as you have time and um, see what else is in there. Um, so that's, a, that's the demo. Uh, I've got a couple of pages of links you can take a look at. Uh, one thing I just want to point out, the, the, I did record a screencast on React and Grails. If you're interested in this stuff, it's worth watching because um, it's the, the project. What happened? OK. Um, because the, the, the basic project structure is the same. So it, it's worth, worth taking a look at it. And slides and sample code are on GitHub at that URL. And thank you. Sorry I ran a few minutes over. If you folks have questions, um, I'm assuming we're out of time now, so you know, 
please ask me afterwards. I'm happy to talk about this stuff more.